Well, thank you. Uh, of course, save your applause to Yen because this might not be a very good talk. So <laughs> you, you just put more pressure on me. Um, so first thing we want to know from you guys before we get into this is um, how people have heard about this talk because that's one of the biggest things we think about when we advertise these is um, how people heard about it. So how many of you just put your hand in the air uh, read about this in The Citizen? Okay. Um, how many through public access channel? Okay, one. Um, how many of you just through word of mouth? You just heard people talking about it? Okay. Um, how many through our Facebook page? Okay. So, Finger Lakes Times. Time. Okay, how many of you through the Finger Lakes Times? Okay. <laughs> Any other source they haven't mentioned um, that people heard about this through? Okay. <laughs> All right, and uh, how many of you have visited our museum before in the past? Okay, so most of you. So uh, museum will be open for about an hour after the talk if you do want to go through really quickly. and. Um, you know, I am very honored to be the first speaker of the 2018 season. And um, Martha, who do we have anybody next on the plate? Or uh, I don't have a confirmed date, but uh, it's more than likely going to be Andy Brokley. Okay. And it will either be on Civil War and the connection with Cuba County, or the ten historic sites, and as it relates to the history of. So you'll want to be sure to come back for that. And we might have a few more. Again, uh, always check the Facebook page and Citizen. We always try to publish stuff there when we become aware of it. Uh, also, don't forget, we do have refreshments in the back of the room. So please feel free to help yourself. And uh, Paul, if you could hit the lights, I think we'll get started. So with this opening slide here, I, I tried to be humorous somewhat. It didn't really work. But I did want to make the opening slide almost look like one of the signs. Um, that's why I put the little tagline down here at the bottom. So we are talking about the historic markers. And what I want to talk about today was the history of those markers, the present state of them, and the future and talk about why these markers are actually important um, and not just these cute little blue and gold signs we see along the road every now and then. These signs actually serve an important purpose. So it all began in 1923. 1923, the New York uh, Historical Association was given the job by the legislature to brainstorm uh, possible ways to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the American Revolution. In 1926, uh, the legislature uh, gave the job to the Commissioner of Education, because of course he wasn't doing anything important at the time, <laughs> to oversee the implementation of the association's ideas. Now one of the association's ideas was the erecting of markers to designate sites that are of historical significance in the colonial, revolutionary, or state formative period. So, in the 1920s and 1930s, to uh, erect a marker, you had to fill out an application with the text, what you wanted it to say, where you were going to put the marker, and historical documentation. So, for example, if you had a bed and breakfast, you couldn't just apply for a sign that said, oh, George Washington slept here. You had to prove it, okay? And then you had to pay the outrageous $2 fee. And once you did that, you had a sign erected. Now, the specs of the sign, um, they were made by the Walton Foundry. Uh, more about that later. Uh, they originally made the sign drape into the early 1990s until they went out of business. Um, the signs are three feet wide by two feet tall, uh, one and a half inches thick, except the borders where they're one inch thick. Uh, they used to be made out of cast iron, and they were painted in blue and gold because that was New York State's official colors. 
okay? Now, as we'll see, there's at least two in Auburn that are blue and red. And again, I'm not sure about that, but uh, it was blue and gold because those were the state colors. So the bulk of the signs that we see today were put up between 1926 and 1936. Uh, funding ends, ends in 1939. Now the reason for this is the state, or the legislature I should say, did not see this as a historical marker program. They saw this as a commemoration project. So eventually it had to end. All right. Um, they weren't going to go around and keep uh, selecting sites and setting up markers. You know, we went up, we set up the markers, we're done, it was fun, but that's it. 1960, it does um, resurrect the program temporarily. Now, I should mention at this point, too, that um, the marker program has gone under the leadership of different uh, entities within the state over the past few years. Uh, originally it was Department of Education. At one point in the 70s it was actually under the DEC for some reason, Department of Environmental Con Conservation. And at one point too it was under New York State Parks. Because of course it's New York State Parks and Historical Preservation. So here are some of those signs. We've seen some of these, I know. Here's one of the blue and red ones. Now the signs usually are of the first settler in an area, first school, first church, and other points of interest. So of course, this is the one for Hardenburg. This is one of the blue and red ones, marking his uh, cabin. Uh, the barracks for the War of 1812, again, marking out an uh, important area. First school in Auburn. First school in Springport. St. Peter's Church, one of the first churches in Auburn. And of course, you always want to point out the important people like Enos Troop. And of course, Enos Troop's sign is by St. Peter's Church because that's where he's buried. He's not in Fort Hill. Um, he was buried at St. Peter's Church. And if you don't know who Enos Troop was, um, well, let's see, he was Auburn postmaster, congressman, circuit judge, governor of New York State, was on the school board too at one point. He actually owned uh, Willowbrook out here on Owasco Lake, which we now call Martin's Point. Of course, when uh, they put in the condominiums, they cut down all the willow trees, so they couldn't call it Willowbrook anymore. I think the brook's still there, but... Um, and then, of course, you know, point out points of interest like signed to Four Hill Cemetery and then Union Springs. Of course, we have Frontenac Island. Now, as I said, 1960, the state decides to temporarily revive this program. But they have a rule. They don't want little signs by the road anymore because those were deemed a distraction. We know how easily people get distracted while driving. <laughs> Happens all the time, especially even now. People have, you know, their cell phones up while they're driving. So due to safety concerns, the new signs were to be erected at rest stops, not along the highway. That led to these giant signs now we see at the rest areas. For example, this is the one by Seneca Falls. You see the outlet store there in the background. But that led to these really big signs, and sometimes you really don't feel like reading all of them. Um, but the state thought that this was a better idea. But again, once they erected these signs at the rest stops, the state said, that's it, there's no more funding. We're, we're ending the program again. And supposedly these signs uh, originally were under the Department of Education. Uh, you can't really see it from where you're sitting, but that's what it says right here, Education Department. And supposedly these signs are actually under now the control of I Love New York. But again, they're not saying any more signs up. So, despite the fact that there is no funding and the program is no longer really recognized by the state, the Office of State History and the Department of Education are encouraging local historians to apply and set up signs. And they did. They had a whole network of historians who would go out, do the research, send it out to the state, and the state would set up a sign for them. 
So this is pretty much how it went for the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, into the 90s, right into the early 2000s. And if you had an active um, local historian, you had signs set up. Uh, the one for Half Acre. And I love this one because it mentions Half Acre as Hell's Half Acre. You drive for a little Half Acre now, there's no more peaceful spot in the county. <laughs> to know that one time was one of the worst places that you could ride into. Um, but of course, this was set up in 1985. And you'll notice too that during this period too, the little New York State symbol on the top went away and it, they would put down the name of the county. They did that for a while. Um, this sign on the Cuga Long Bridge was set up in 1983, talking about Cuga Bridge. This one, uh, 76, denoting where there used to be a small Cuga village um, near Union Springs. Now this was one Auburn set Now as it gets in the early 2000s, they do, do start putting the little state symbol back on top. But here was one for Columbian Rope, set up in 2004. Oop, you already saw that one. Case Research Lab got a sign up. And the Willard Mansion, or. Yeah, as the, as the people that paid for them, yeah. <coughs> and then, of course, this one on Martha Wright. So this is how this program was going for quite a while. Um, if you really wanted the sign and you hit, really had some historians who uh, were willing to do the research, you could get that sign still set up, but the state officially had no role. So the present, 2014, the state historian... Uh, he's no longer there anymore. Bob Weeble seeks to encourage local historians to take charge of the erecting of new historical markers. Again, he was he really wanted to encourage local historians to start start setting up these signs. Um, it was to be assisted by the Association of Public Historians of New York State and the Pomeroy Foundation. More on them later. Currently, New York State is one of the few states that does not have a historical marker program. When you're one of the 13 original states, when you have the statesmen, inventors, that have come out of this state, and you don't have a program to actively educate the public about them, I, I, I really don't find the justification for that. Maybe one of you does. Um, but we're one of the few states that does not actively fund this uh, historical marker program. And again, when you're one of the 13 original states, that's, that's for me, that's a little bit difficult. So this comes to the William G. Pomeroy Foundation for History for Life. Now this um, foundation began, well, um, back up a little bit. October 19, 2004, William or Bill Pomeroy was diagnosed with acute uh, myeloid um, leukemia. Now he found at the time that um, he was looking for a donor and he found that there really needed to, there was a need to di defer, uh, diversify the uh, Be The Match registry. So after he did find a donor in 2005 and got a transplant, um, he, his foundation has worked um, with the National Marrow Donor Program, Bone Marrow, to uh, fund drives, you know, find donors in diverse communities so that there are more donors in the registry so more people can get donations um, if they need it. However, he also was very interested in history his whole life. So in 2006, he began the Historic Roadside Marker Grant Program for sites in Onondaga County only. In 2012, he opened it up to every county. So if you are a municipality or a nonprofit, you are eligible to apply for a grant. Currently, he also has a grant to fund historical markers in Ohio, because that's where his family comes from. 
And also he's starting a program too to erect more markers along the Erie Canal. Um, now currently, as of this talk, they have set up over 450 markers across New York State. And here are some of the, oh, to receive a grant, you need, like I said, you need to be a municipality or a nonprofit. Uh, the event must have happened between 1740 and 1917. Now, I know that during their last big drive, uh, which actually ended April 1st, one of the things that they were pushing people on their website to do was to uh, get markers for World War I sites, since they happened 100 years ago. So um, I don't know if this changes every January, that kind of end date. But again, um, as it is right now, like, we'll go back to the bread and, bed and breakfast example. If you have one and you want to put up a sign saying, well, Elvis slept here, you can't do that yet. Okay, you got to wait a few years. Um, and also this kind of date here, 1740, some of the markers set by the state are events that happened before 1740. So again, I don't know why they have that kind of date right there saying, well, just get it in between there. Uh, you need to provide quite a bit of primary source documentation. Uh, historical significance, and you're really limited, to, limited in how many letters, periods, and commas you can actually have on that sign. So once they approve your grant, it goes to Catskill Castings. Now, I, like I said, originally these were made by the Walton Foundry. And they kind of still are. The Walton Foundry was in Walton, New York, and um, was a very big foundry at one point. And uh, they were very well known for making uh, manhole covers at one point. Now, they actually had two sites. The site in each branch uh, came about when these two brothers started a foundry. Uh, they wanted to increase their output, so their father bought them out and he partnered with Walton Foundry. Uh, both foundries at the time would make the signs, and Catskill Castings came about in the early 90s. Walton Foundry uh, closed because of foreign competition. But this one gentleman, uh, George Haynes, he had started working at the old Walton Foundry when he was still just a high school kid. He worked there part time and he remembers working on the signs, the markers. And when he heard that Walton Foundry was gonna close, he was kind of worried that, you know, who's gonna make the signs now? He said, I've been doing this since high school. So he bought out um, the East Branch and he's still making the signs there to this day. Uh, they're made of aluminum now, weigh about 50 pounds, so they're heavy. They're painted in national blue and sunset yellow. Now those are rustinoleum colors, okay? Um, also Benjamin Moore makes, makes them too. If you can't find rustinoleum, you can go to Benjamin Moore and get those colors. Uh, cost for a standard marker, remember that $2 fee? They're a bit expensive. Plus the $30 shipping fee, but that's UPS. Uh, you get your choice of two different mounting poles. Both are $114 plus $25 shipping fee. And I, I put down this part here about the 10 to 12 weeks for delivery because Catskill Castings on their website says, do not plan an unveiling ceremony until you actually get the sign. <laughs> so there, there, there might be a little add on to that 12 weeks there. And here are some of the signs set up by um, Pomeroy. Now this is uh, the stone school in front of Union Springs right now. They finally got a sign up for that. Uh, gypsum, gypsum quarries. First gypsum found in North America was found right around here. Uh, this, of course, is the sign outside the front net Frontenac Museum. This is about the Frontenac, the ship that caught fire on Kugel Lake years ago. 
1907. Huge tragedy at the time. Um, and these old quarries, which are believed by Union Springs, um, when these quarries were worked, the stone taken out of there was shipped down to lower Manhattan so they could pave the streets down there. And I think that's pretty interesting that our stone was being brought to Manhattan to pave it. Now obviously that's not what the sidewalks are still made out of, but it's, it's still there. That stone is still underneath what they have today. Stone from the Finger Lakes. And without the sign, how many of us would know that? So the markers in Cuga County, now when the state ran the program, 2,886 markers were erected. That also includes the period of, you know, after the 60s and things like that. That's how many markers were erected across the state. Cayuga County had 176 markers. That was the most of any other county. Albany comes in second. And then, of course, Ulster comes in third. But look, we have them beat by 30 markers. Okay? Now... Few states have, a uh, few counties have over 100 markers, actually. Um, I think the fourth highest, I forget the name of the county right now, but I think they only had 105. Um, some counties have none. For example, uh, Orlean County has zero. Hamilt uh, yeah, Hamilton, Lewis County have none. Of course, Hamilton and Lewis are out in the Adirondacks. There's a lot of history there. There was just nobody around there to see it happen. Um, but those are the three counties that have no markers. Uh, Allegheny County only has four. Again, a big county, a lot of history, only four markers. Again, Allegheny County has that population problem. Um, I went to school down there, and it's, it's one of the only counties I've ever been to where people measure distance by the number of hills. I remember this girl was telling us where she lived one time, and she's like, well, as you leave campus, you go by the three hills, take a left, then you go by the other two hills, and my house is right there. Do you live on a street or what? <laughs> now, here is the problem, and this is why we're giving this talk. Roughly more than 40 of those signs here in Cuyahoga County are missing. Um, I think my last count actually was around 41 or 42 signs missing. 27 markers were erected in Auburn. 13 still exist, 14 are gone. Now I know this is, you know, a slim majority, but still the fact is the majority of the markers that were set up by the state are no longer there. Now this is something that we need to think about too. Now like I said, this program started in 1926. Now our signs here in Kew County are mostly 1932. But for any signs that were set up in 1926, in less than 10 years, those signs are going to be over 100 years old. These signs are no longer about history. They are part of our history. And we're losing them pretty quickly. Well, why? Well, this is a sign that used to sit outside Union Springs showing where pretty much the Cuga Reservation used to be. If you want to go out and looking for this sign now, that's what you'll find. It simply broke. It fell right over. What also happens to these signs? Well, you know, sometimes cars hit them. <laughs> that can happen. Snow plows claim quite a few. and road construction. Anytime you have a street widening project or anything like that, the, the signs have to be taken down. But the construction company is under no obligation to put that sign back up. So what happens to it? Vandalism is another problem. Because we know how much teenagers love to have old New York State marker signs on their you know, walls. And another thing that happened to a lot of these signs 
is what we hear in Auburn sometimes referred to as Armageddon, urban renewal. This used to be our armory. And why did it get knocked down? For the arterial, urban renewal. That used to be North Street. I can't even get my bearings looking at this picture. But think of all that we lost in this city because of urban renewal. Now, why did it take out so many signs? Well, because some signs used to be bolted right to the buildings. Uh, the Bostwicks still exist. It's on Auburn Public Theater right now. It's another one of the blue and red ones. But many of the signs that we've lost, yeah, they were bolted to a building. Well, when we knocked that building down, what happened to the sign? Now, we have a few theories, but we have no facts. The other problem that happens to some of these signs is eventually they get old. Yes, making something out of cast iron is a good idea, but eventually you put that on essential New York weather, you know, eventually it's going to break. Like this uh, sign right here that talks about the old Genesee Road or the old Genesee Turnpike. From Hardenburg Corners to Harris Ferry, to Harris Ferry crossed here. And I'm going to talk about the significance of that sign just a little bit. But look at the condition of this sign. It looks like it was set up in 1800. Almost. Um, or this one right here for North Street Cemetery. I know you can't read it. I can't either. Um, this is one of the signs missing, by the way. Last time, a few times I've gone by the cemetery, it's not there. Uh, this one here in front of Holy Family. Marking one of our, uh, our first school. And this one, somebody decided to hold up using wood. Uh, again, showing the reservation. This was the Cugas Reservation. They did sell it to the state. Um, but the, as this points out here, um, it was sold in 1799. And the, a body of Tuscaroras, which were the sixth nation of the Iroquois, were still living there at that point. So again, why are we so concerned about these signs? Who cares if they fall down? The state obviously doesn't seem to. They no funding. Um, we'll put them under the DEC and they'll be fine. So why do we care? Well, because they tell us stories. Uh, Howard Ford wrote a book called Sure Signs. And last time I was at the Barnes & Noble in Ithaca under their local interest shelf, there was still a copy there. And I know you can probably find it on Amazon. They love to find rare and old books and things like that. If you don't have the book, it's, it's a nice thing to have, especially if you fancy yourself a local history buff. So in other words, you cannot borrow mine. Um, <laughs> but he said this about the signs, and I think he said it best, which is why I included his quote. They serve in the same way as the headlines of a newspaper, alerting you to the subject, but for the details you must read more deeply elsewhere. So what are the stories that they tell? Well, I'm only going to give you a little depth into two of them. I'm not going into the details, just the depth. First is the Iroquois Confederacy. Now, one of the articles I read about the signs was one of the historians that was talking about the marker program said the thing that he didn't like was when the program first started was the Native Americans were not talked about. Now, of our signs that were set up during that period, 35 of them deal with Native Americans. Because they tell the story of the Iroquois Confederation, Confe uh, Confederacy. The Mohawk, the Onondaga, the Seneca, the Oneida, the Cayuga, the Tuscarora. There are many clans. This is where they were spread out in New York State. Um, they were further spread out across the country too, I should mention. Um, especially in uh, the late 1600s, early 1700s, um, they were involved in something called the Beaver Wars, in which they decided to take out some of their competition in the European beaver trade. Uh, they destroyed five other nations during that war, including the Huron, which at one point were one of the larger tribes in the Northeast. 
and that's generally what they would have looked like. Uh, this Iroquois from about 1800, 1820, you see the woman there. Uh, the women really held the power in the tribes too. They chose the chiefs and things like that. There's a warrior on the side, and this is what, what one of their dancers would have looked like. And we do have many sites pointing to this. Now, actually, Fort Hill is not an Iroquois site, as far as we can tell. We think the Iroquois used it, but they did not build it. There's a lot of mystery surrounding Fort Hill. Now, if you go to Fort Hill Cemetery today, it, it's not as, as impressive as it used to be. When you get to the top of that hill, you'll see some mounds. Well, from some sources I've read, originally when they were settling Auburn, those mounds were almost man-sized. Now imagine going up for the hills, going up for the woods up that hill, and all of a sudden seeing these huge, you know, piles there. Pretty impressive. Uh, Wasco. This is actually a sign on the prison. Um, there was a Cuga village right where the prison is now for many years. Um, the early settlers of Hardenburg Corners actually um, traded with them. And there was friendly, friendly relations between the two. Oh. I showed this sign before. Yeah, if you're expecting me to pronounce that name, not gonna happen. Uh, Jiwanga, Jiwunga? Um, but again, another small Cuga village that was here. And then, of course, this was. And like I said, this was uh, Cuga Castle. Down there, and um, this is right by uh, in between Union Springs and Aurora, Route 90. Um, Cuga Castle was the principal Cuga village. It was like, you could almost call it their capital. Uh, destroyed by the Sullivan campaign. And this uh, sign is right next to it, an Indian mound. Again, this is where the village was and also about the early Jesuit mission there. I'll get more to that in just a little sec. But did you know the Iroquois, although they were hunter-gatherers, their main source of food was farming. Now, why is that important? Well, you might remember back to school, how did the first civilizations like Mesopotamia start? Why did Egypt flourish? Because they learned agriculture. The Iroquois were learning agriculture. If they hadn't had European contact, How quickly would they have developed into some of the stronger civilizations we remember today? They were definitely on that track. Track. Um, they were, I have there one of the few democracies. Let, let's be honest, they were the only democracy in 1570. Okay? Even England was still ruled by a monarch. Yet they were a democracy. Now, the way their democracy worked was. The tribes ran their day-to-day -day affairs, but um, important decisions like waging war, punishment for crimes like murder, that was decided by the Confederacy. This is very close to how the United States Articles of Confederation worked. You had the states and they could do what they wanted, but there was also a central government that made the big decisions. We still have that. You know, the states can run their own affairs, but you know, the feds have the final say on the big decisions. And actually, it should be mentioned too that many of our founding fathers did greatly admire the Iroquois. Benjamin Franklin, for example. Uh, in the late 1600s, they were probably the most powerful military in North America. Again, I mentioned the Beaver Wars. Um, and there were many instances, instances in which they went up against the French, uh, both in the Beaver Wars and the French and Indian Wars, and kicked their butt. So they could even challenge the Europeans. Now, when you look down South America, Cortez took out the Aztecs in about a week. 
Uh, the Inca didn't do well against um, the Pizarro brothers, but the Iroquois kicked the French's butt a few times, kicked the Americans' butts a few times. England was, England was smart. England didn't mess with the Iroquois. They did get in trouble with the Oneidas, though, but very powerful military force. And, of course, Cayuga County is named after the Cugas. The Cugas lived here, as the signs show. Uh, the people of the Great Swamp. They also go by the name of the people of the Great Pipe because probably being known as the Swamp People is the most nicest name. So oh, we're also the people of the Pipe. Now, did you know the Jesuits began working among the Iroquois in 1654? Um, these four men that I mentioned here, and you're going to tell I can't read friends, uh, Joseph Schumann, Rene Menard, Stephen Descari, and Peter Raflix are the first known Europeans in the Finger Lakes. The first four. Now, one of the problems the Jesuits had in uh, converting the Iroquois was the Jesuits were French. And the Iroquois and the French at times had very contentious relationships. So, um, as one of the Jesuit missionaries once wrote, you know, the, the first year we were accepted into the tribe with all these celebrations and dancing and music and food, and then the next year, you know, we're being chased around with a tomahawk um, while they're laughing. So, but still, those signs like the Indian Mound one I showed you remind us of that. These were the first Europeans to ever come to our area. These Jesuits. Very brave group, very interesting group. Uh, not your run of the mill missionary or monk. And of course, this sign right here, this wasn't said by the state, this was actually said by the Knights of Columbus in 1911, the local Auburn Council here, of which I'm a member. Um, now, this sign has fell, fallen into disrepair, and we are going to erect a new marker soon. Um, this marker, though, when it was set up, it attracted 350 people from the city of Auburn to see this unveiled. When they arrived, and keep in mind, this is 1911. Uh, they didn't drive down there in their cars. Um, when they got there, there were already 500 people from Ithaca and other areas waiting. There were 850 people then, roughly, not counting uh, you know, the bishop of the Diocese of Rochester, the mayor of Auburn, the other notables that were there. Um, 850 people to see this monument unveiled. And there's a closer look at it. Of course, you can't read it from there, but it has the names and what these men did. Uh, did you know the Cuga side with the British during the American Revolution? Washington ordered an invasion of the Iroquois homeland. Uh, the Clinton Sullivan campaign, while destructive, uh, was pretty much a big failure. They had several goals and they failed to achieve any of them. Um, they were going to stop the Indians from raiding uh, American settlements. Um, however, uh, the Iroquois the next summer just started raiding again, more fierce than they were before. And uh, the Iroquois never officially surrendered. Well, they did after the war, after the British made peace with the Americans, the Iroquois did. But uh, the Clinton Sullivan campaign did not take the fight out of them. However, um, it did help our side by making the Iroquois more dependent on the British for supplies. Since we burned their fields, we burned their supplies, uh, they had to go to the British more. Well, the British was having a tough time supplying themselves. So this did put a strain on the British war effort. And, of course, we have signs commemorating the Sullivan campaign. Uh, this one is from right across the street. Cuga Castle. Again, that was the main Indian village. If you've seen that sign on Route 90, try to envision that. Okay? That there was this huge tribe there. Kind of like their headquarters, along with that Jesuit mission. Really kind of amazing that that was happening just miles from where we're sitting right now. 
another one about the Sullivan campaign where they crossed the river, crossed the lake. And then you see these markers set up too. These were set up by the state, 1929. Um, this is the one down the village of Cuga. Um, there's also one in Aurora, Union Springs. Uh, actually, does anybody know where the closest one is to here? A little bit of trivia? Anybody? Did you know there's one right across the street? One of these? If um, you go to where White Bridge is, you'll see there's a little road that leads down under the bridge. Don't, don't drive your car down there because there's nowhere to turn around. Um, unless you're really, really good at backing up at an angle. Uh, but there is a monument there. And again, it talks about uh, Gavin's Port because he had a detachment of 100 soldiers. He had to um, investigate a Wasco Lake and Skinny Atlas Lake and make sure there were no Native Americans here or, or stores of their supplies. So, but actually, that's, that's the closest monument right here. It's a very well-kept secret. If you go down the boat launch, you'll see it. Uh, but to read it, you've got to walk across White Bridge, walk down the road, read it. And it's a very nice looking one, too. Uh, they are nice signs. Uh, the front does have a little map. And then the back, it uh, talks about what happened there. Another story they tell is westward migration in New York State. Now, when we talk about westward migration, we do. We, we think of stuff like this, right? The Oregon Trail crossing the Rockies, Canastota wagons, giant white women walking across the plains. This is what we think of when we think of westward migration. Isn't it? This is what we've been told to expect. Um, she's also showing an awful lot of leg for a 19th century painting, but um, not very modest. But this is what we think of when we think of westward migration. This is what we've been told about. But westward migration started in New York. This is what we looked like after the Revolution. We didn't have this half. That was Iroquois land. Um, now, of course, the Carolinas did some westward expansion. Virginia did after the war. Pennsylvania did. But also New York State. If these colonies had not expanded, westward migration might have come later in our history. One of the reasons the Erie Canal was opened was to go west. And they didn't mean, you know, the Wild West. They meant west of Syracuse. We need some way to get out there. Uh, route 20, the Genesee Turnpike. That was a major route west. Now, after the war, this is pretty much what the Finger Lakes look like. Uh, here are the lakes. Atisco, Skinny Atlas, Owasco, Cayuga, Seneca. You see the reservations for the Ondagas and the Cugas. And then, of course, the state went out and made up all these little townships. Now, nobody was living here yet. Uh, they went out and they cut up this land because Congress realized we don't have any money to pay all those soldiers that fought in the war. That's a little bit embarrassing, but we can give them land. However, um, not everybody took advantage of this program. Of course, try to put yourself in their shoes. Let's say you were a blacksmith in New York City, went to fight in the Revolution. Now, when you come home, are you going to strike out into the great unknown and try to set up a farm somewhere? Just imagine lugging your forge out that way. Or are you just going to set up where your shop used to be and do that? Okay? Um, at first, not too many people were into this idea. They... they Beard going, you know, at least when you went across the Oregon Trail, you were in the Great Plains for a while. It's nice and wide and open. You're going for the woods. You're going for a small little trail. Um, back then, it was estimated that uh, the rate of travel on the Genesee Turnpike was about 10 miles per day. It was slow going. You were constantly getting stuck in the mud. Your wagon was breaking because the road was so rough. 
You had to figure out a way to get around this little gully that was in the middle of the trail. It was tough. And what if you got to this land and it was rocky or you couldn't get anything to grow or there were still a bunch of Native Americans there that uh, had sharpened tomahawks? It was a big risk going out here. But still, you get these adventurous people which are willing to do it. Now, one thing I'll mention really quickly too, you can tell by the names here, and probably people have wondered this before, how we get all these Roman and Greek names in New York State. Well, the guy that did this for New York State that was in charge of the program, he was trying to show off how educated he was. Now, one, way, um, one thing that you did when you went to school back then, especially after you got out of the one-room schoolhouse, was you studied Greek and Latin. This was his way of showing how cultured he was by naming these lands Hannibal, Cato, Brutus, Ovid, Ulysses, yeah, he's trying to show off, okay? Then, of course, we went by and renamed some places after Native Americans or ourselves, but that's what he was attempting to do. So when you drive through Pompeii, for example, that's why it's called Pompeii. There's another map, a little bit more accurate of what it would look like. Again, it was scary traveling out this way. Now, this thing here helped a lot. This is one of the greatest engineering marvels of early America. At one point, this was the longest bridge in the Northeast. The longest bridge in the Western Hemisphere, the Cuga Bridge. About a mile long. Um, this stretch from Cuga, New York, all the way over to Bridgeport on the other end. And this was the only bridge for a long time across Cuga Lake. Uh, the Cuga Bridge, now I took this quote from Scott Anderson. He wrote a book recently here about Auburn. If you don't have it, you should get it. It's a pretty good book. But um, again, I decided to use his quote because he says it best. Uh, the Cuga Bridge, built in 1800, assured the prosperity of the Auburn area. The bridge attracted a constant stream of individuals heading west with money in their pockets and needs to be filled. Auburn was at then the trip's beginning. Many of these families had fresh money. They had left behind much of the old equipment because um, they had sold the old farm, uh, thinking to purchase newer and better things along the way. In Auburn, they could find a fresh bed, a hot meal, a stiff drink, and as fine a hammer or scythe, rake or hoe, as they were likely to find anywhere else. Kind of sounds like Auburn was in early independence Missouri, doesn't it? We were. This explains later some of the other industries that form in Auburn. It's no mistake Osborne Corporation was here. It's no mistake the Auburn Tool Company, largest tool maker at one point, was here, or Auburn Works, or A.W. Stevens. That's no mistake. But that's because of the Genesee Turnpike. And these individuals who, despite all the horrors in the forest, moved west despite all that. Now, you can argue whether these people were just brave or foolish or a bit of both. But to leave behind a sure thing and just go where no one else had been that was a huge leap of faith. You know? How many of us today would risk our families by doing that? Risk our own lives? You know? I've got a great life here along the Hudson River. Why am I going to travel off to Ovid? What's waiting for me there? Uh, Cougar Bridge was one mile long and 22 feet wide. And like I said, it was the longest bridge for a long time in the Western Hemisphere. It did fall down in 1804 um, because they tried to use mud as a support. That didn't work really very well. Whoever designed the bridge forgot that Cuga Lake freezes, especially where the bridge was, and that led to some problems. Um, and eventually, by the 1850s, they had already built the free bridge, which is that one um, on Route 20 right now, when you're by Montezuma Wildlife Refuge. 
that had been opened up. Cougar Bridge was a toll bridge. You had to pay to go across it. Okay. Um, here's a bridge held up by mud, and they paid you to go across it. Or you paid them. Yeah. Um, they should have paid you. Um, but again, Cuga Bridge is an interesting story. The toll, um, the toll house at Cuga, the basement of that was a jail. That was Cuga County's first jail. Uh, it was a trap door. Now, we don't know if they lured you down or if they just tricked you to stand on top of them and pull the lever. <laughs> I like to think it was the latter. Uh, but yeah, that, that's a lot of our history right there. You know, when we talk about great bridges and uh, these engineering marvels, oh, we think of the Brooklyn Bridge and the Golden Gate Bridge. How many other bridges go across a Finger Lake? And how many other bridges led to this state being settled? You couldn't go up by Montezuma back then. That was a swamp. And the mosquitoes up there were something fierce. Just ask any of those canal workers that died when they were digging the Erie Canal through it. There were quite a few Irishmen that died in those swamps, digging that canal. So if you were gonna get across that, this lake, okay, think about it, a person on westward migration is gonna go and stop and say, hey, that's a beautiful lake. No, that's another thing I gotta get across. And this bridge facilitated that. It's why the Genesee country was settled. And there's, of course, the sign about the Cuga Long Bridge, one mile long. Uh, yeah, 1857 was its last hurrah. Um, carried the stream of Western migration. And there's a sign uh, the village of Cuga set up. I won't try to read that from you, but you can go there now and read it. It's a very nice plaque. Um, but again, the importance of this area. We were what... We were the last civilization people saw on their way west. Okay, through our streets, through our roads, where these people, as I said before, were both brave and foolhardy. They had dreams, they had aspirations. They were hoping against hope. And by remembering the roads that they traveled on, hopefully we remember them. And that's why we study history. We don't study history for the trivia or to remember a date. We study history because history has already determined our present. And like I try to tell my students, we have a chance to change history. If we do not, history's gonna make its own decisions as we go into the future. We've already seen it do that. And let's face it, sometimes time has a really sick, sarcastic sense of humor. But we can change that. That's why we study history. To see where we are. Not to see what happened. Where we are and where we are going. And maybe something important to remember is the brave people that have come before us. Uh, again, Yager Tavern, that was a main tavern on the way to, you know, as you were going through these roads. Again, there were usually about a tavern or inn every 10 miles because that's as far as you would move in a day. Um, taverns were very important. You, you need to understand these early communities. The taverns were built before the church. The, that was the people's priority. Okay? Um, but the tavern was. It was where you could get a drink, get a bed for the night, get information from other travelers. They were very important. Stories still waiting to be discovered. And, you know, in my way of a teacher, I w I'm assigning this to you. It's due next Monday. Um, but some of the things these signs tell us is the inventors and inventions of Cuga County. How many people here know about Jethro Wood? Not enough. You know, um, he's considered one of the greatest inventors in American history. One of the most important. Auburn, when it was an industrial giant. We were a land of faith. Think of how many different faiths there were in this county. The Quakers down Union Springs and Popular Ridgeway. 
Um, look at Auburn. How many cities of less than 30,000 people support six Catholic parishes? To say nothing of the two Greek Orthodox, well, Greek and Russian Orthodox churches, St. Nicholas and St. Peter and Paul. They teach about our natural and prehistoric history. Now, these are two of the signs that are missing in uh, Q County right now, but did you guys know that there used to be a sign on the Popular Ridge Aurora Road, a sign about an elm tree that was they tested was actually from the primeval forest in that area, it was still standing. The sign's gone, the tree might be gone too. How many of you knew? Uh, how many of you know where on Route 90 uh, the California redwood is? It was planned in 1826. The sign's gone. Tree might be gone too, but again, that's our natural history. Uh, not in our county, but um, there is a sign too commemorating where there was a woolly mammoth found. If you go across the street to the park over by the ball field, there's a sign. Now in the summer it's blocked by one of the trees they have there, but there's a sign there marking it in Algonquin Village. It's pre-Iroquois. And we saw when the Iroquois started in the 1500s. There is habitation here before then. Fort Hill was probably built before then. Definitely was. And again, these markers remind us of that. You know, Auburn didn't start with Hardenburg. Um, we're a land where very important people and women once walked. People involved in the suffrage movement. People involved in the abolition movement. Inventors. Um, we'll show with a sign of hands. How many of you have heard of William Seward? Good? Okay, keep the hands up. Harry Tubman. Ted Case. Okay. Enos Troop. Before I showed you the sign, be honest. Okay, some of the hands are going down. That's better. Um, Jethro Wood. Hmm, again, more hands go down. Okay. Um, but again, how many of you knew about Martha Wright? How many of you know how important her husband was? He had a very important story to tell. Okay. We have great examples here. The, the Roman historian Libby once said that the study of history is the best medicine for a sick mind. For in it, you find heroes and villains. Find things to take as examples and rotten things to avoid. And this isn't, isn't this a time when we need his, heroes? Don't you think we can inspire some of our young people if they knew more about these people? We do have a proud military heritage. More than the barracks in 1812 or the old mil military depot uh, camp that used to be over there on Lake Ave, very proud military heritage in this area. And again, it's a story that needs to be told more, needs to be remembered more, and so much more. So why were we giving this talk? Well, the Auburn History Club, of which I, I guess I'm a member, um, they, they won't admit to it, but uh, a few years ago, we started a push to uh, renovate these signs. And we did renovate one out by Centerport, the Centerport Aqueduct sign. We uh, got someone to repaint that. And we've been trying to track down these missing signs. Well, Paul uh, Saxton has a sign uh, currently in his uh, garage. Uh, that one about the Cougar Reservation, that's in his garage. He found it while cutting hay one day. Found it lying on the ground. Now, those uh, 14 signs Auburn is currently missing, well, we know that supposedly after urban renewal, the, the legend is, is that those signs were stored in the basement of Auburn Police Station. However, we currently have learned they're no longer there. So he, who has them? City garage doesn't know. County garage doesn't know. City hall doesn't know. Well, now, I've seen him there. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, we, we have confirmation they used to be there. But they're gone. Now, of course, the scary thing is that that was state property. Um, so whoever, now, it could very well be those signs are lost forever. They could be in the Auburn junkyard. But like I said, these signs are not only educational for us, but they are also a boost to terrorism. What does Auburn call itself now? History's hometown. Wouldn't it be nice if we had some more signs talking about that? Talking about that history? So if you find a, find a sign, well, you can try to fix it yourself. A good wire brush will take out that rust, and uh, I gave you the colors. Don't try to lift them, though. Yes. But, um, you know, this might be a good project for, say, um, anybody that knows anybody that's involved with a Boy Scout troop. Maybe they would want to adopt a few signs, try to get them fixed up, or anything like that. Again, the Pomeroy Foundation will set up a sign now. I don't think anybody has asked them yet about, hey, what about the signs that were set up and have fallen down? If they would, um, you know, try to set those up again or something like that. Um, actually, Paul, you could turn on the lights there if you want. Okay, everybody just close your eyes. Okay, you can open them again. Um, so yeah, this could be maybe a great project for anybody that works with a certain youth group or something like that or is involved with a nonprofit. But pretty much we wanted to give this talk to alert people to this problem. Because as I mentioned today, we're losing these signs. And with it, we lose the history. And if we lose the history, we lose the inspiration. We lose who we are. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and we saw that. Yeah, and we saw that with some of the signs today. I mean, some of them are deteriorating right on the pole. Sometimes it's a pole that's deteriorating. Um, that one in front of Holy Family, um, I don't know if you noticed, but the mount that connects that to the pole is completely cracked. It's almost completely gone. In a few more years, a few more winters, that's going to be lying on the ground. And like I said, I still don't know what happened to the one on the North Street Cemetery, our first cemetery. Um, and again, we're, we're losing that history. So really what we've been encouraging people to do is to um, take notice of the signs. If you find one lying on the ground or in very bad condition, you know, try to tell somebody who you think might be able to help and get that sign restored. Well, don't tell me. I, I, I don't care enough. Um, well, like I said, if, if you know a group that could um, do it, like I, I said, like maybe a youth group or some group that would be able to get their hands on the pain and things like that, that'd be a good group to tell. Um, and maybe hopefully somebody here knows some groups that want to get out and do some things in the community. Like I mentioned Boy Scouts because they do have to do some projects that have to do with local and state history. Um, so this would be a great way to do it. Pick a few broken signs and fix them. Yes? Um, the, on the State Museum website, there's a little section about the signs as well. Mm -hmm. And it says, two, two caveats. One is, consult your local authorities, which would be your town supervisor or town supervisor. The other thing is, before you start working on signs, you need to get permission. You, yeah, if, if they are on private property. Yeah, you do need to determine the land. Um, most of the ones set up in the 30s were put on state ground at the time. Uh, but now some of that is private property. Yeah, you, you do need to figure that out first. However, when the state, um, when, and I checked the museum's website, yeah, they're like, just contact the local authorities. Well, what we found through some of our research is that you tell them and that's it they don't care. Like right now, all the, we had a stack of signs after urban renewal. Nobody knows where they are. 
The local authorities had them. They didn't do anything with them, except lose them. So, exactly. Um, and yeah, and I, I was reading another site too saying, oh, just call the local highway department. They'll put that sign right back up. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're not. Um, you might be able, actually able to set up a marker between when you told them and when they actually showed up. 100 years later, the truck came and said, we're not doing this. So, yeah, that, that is what they try to say. But again, um, they say contact the highway departments. Well, nobody ever told the highway department that. So they're, they're not equipped to. They don't bother. Uh, some of these signs, too, what they really need is a good-fashioned welding job. So maybe this is something um, we could contact maybe local BOCES students who take a welding course. Hey, here's five or so signs. Give the kids some experience. But really, we want people to, you know, look after these signs, preserve these signs. If you see them missing, call somebody and let them know. If you bug City Hall enough, maybe they'll do something. And if you are part of a nonprofit, Maybe the next mean say, hey, you know, we can apply for a sign. I think there's a certain place where there needs to be one. So that's really why we're giving this talk, is we want a way to preserve these markers of history. They're eye-catching, and like we said, they're a great headline to just how important Cuyahoga County is. So any questions or comments or anything like that? Yeah. And 10 or 15 of them restored a large number at that time. Yeah, the Yorkers used to be a statewide group, and of course they um, disbanded. And I, I was a Yorker for a brief time in the 90s. And uh, yeah, we had a big thing down in Binghamton, and it was a lot of fun. And uh, then that ceased to be a thing. But yeah, um, it'd be a great project for a local history club uh, in, in a high school, for example. Those used to be big deals. Um, it'd be great, too, if, uh, if anyone knew any, had any contacts at Syracuse University. I know uh, SUNY Cortland has a very big history club. They used to. That somebody could encourage them, hey, you know, guys, maybe you'd like to travel out and save some of these signs. Cortland County doesn't have that many signs either, so, you know, that, that would give them an excuse to branch out more. Um, Coral, I think, only had about 30 signs. And that would, and that's a good point too, because there was one article I was reading. Uh, this one uh, guy, he is he is a his, he is a state historian. He would like to see um, the state again take some more ownership of these signs and do a project like that. Have local historians go around the county or their respective county and find first of all if the sign isn't there, say something. And uh, if it's in bad shape like that, uh, some of the ones I showed you, somehow get that restored. But yeah, um, but it, again, it, it, it's good that at the local level we're thinking about this, but I think we really, if can be, kind of have to nudge, you know, our county officials, state officials saying, hey, we need to, we need to do something about these. Because having the signs up is great, but if they're going to look all rusted and corroded too, they're not going to help educate anybody. They're not going to help tourism. You're going to have a tourist look at that and go, oh, gosh, I don't want to read that. Ford Hill? The sign's all rusted. I'm not going up there. So, yeah, it, it's, it's, it is something important to have these preserved. 
Anyone else? We even take rude comments. It's it's not a big deal. <laughs> This is it right now. I'm, I'm trying to start the grassroots right here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just a radical giving the speech to you guys. Now at this point, you gotta take that torch forward. Um, <laughs> Martha, you're gonna be leading the march to City Hall. So, <laughs> don't worry, you'll be able to take rest stops along the way. And that's good. And yeah, like I said, one thing um, nobody, as I know of, yet has asked if the Pomeroy Foundation would set up signs that have been torn down. Um, and whether they would make you go for the whole process of finding the historical documentation that the sign was already up. I asked that three years ago. Oh, really? Oh, really? They, they might, too. They're, they're pretty, pretty good about putting out new signs. They had a new sign for up there, where they're out there. Mm -hmm. We're working on a new one right now, trying to get the Henry Wells had a sign in Port Byron for years, and trying to rank all this in Waitsport, because uh, his partner, his new uh, car will live to the top of the road, and soon he has no sign. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, and two, I, I don't think we want to end up like New York City. New York City had 35 markers under the state program. I read an article by a guy who did a photo essay. He went around New York City. He knew where all the signs were supposed to be. He found one. And that only existed because it was actually um, bolted to the building. But I don't think we want to come to the point where we have none of those signs left. There's no map that I know of, even Wikipedia, even though it mentions all the sign in Howard Ford's book does, they only give you street, street directions. Um, so a lot of times if you're going to a community you don't know, you might have to search before you find that sign. But yeah, no one's ever made a map that I've seen. Um, so as of yet, but again, maybe that's something that uh, we need to work on too is, you know, not only should the state publish a better database of the signs that they have, but also maybe a map so it's easier for tourists to find these signs. All right. I think it's part of the same family. Yeah. I, I think that's all part of the same family tree. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we have, we have the giant anvil outside the county courthouse, too. I mean, the county office building, so that's about him. So there is a big monument to him. True. Well, then, of course, on Route 92 by the... Yeah. Well, it's just like Route 92 where that uh, stone cross is. There's three sar signs right there along with the cross and the Sullivan marker. So yeah, that would, they're very close together. In the back, yes. Is there any database or anything on what these signs were? I mean, if you had to put in a way to find out Uh, Wikipedia has um, a listing of all the signs. Uh, Howard Ford has a listing. There was a pamphlet published at one point, but that pamphlet was never updated. The state, but the state did, and I think the pamphlet, the last time they did a comprehensive pamphlet, that was done in the 80s, shortly after the program went under the control of New York State Parks. But they wrote the pamphlet and that was it. And there were signs the state set up after that, which are not in that pamphlet. 
uh, Wikipedia's list. You just go on Wikipedia, New York State Historical Markers. 